Been a while. What's up? Nate Sprout, Backyard Preacher. Welcome. You're a Reverend Reverend. Here again. And, of course, like usual, another controversial topic that um, probably will give me a whole lot of hot water with my fundamental, my fundamental friends. Um, obviously, as the title states, is the Bible too long? I'm holding a Bible right here. As most people know, um, I've studied the Bible on, uh, on a graduate level. Uh, and studied it just personally all my life uh, for the vast majority of 39 years. Uh, and when I first became a Christian, I did not question anything from the Bible uh, at all. You know, we were always afraid of the words in the Revelation that if you take away any word from this book, will he will take away the uh, the glories of heaven. And if you add anything, you'll be added to the fires of hell or to the judgments that are written down in Revelation. So when you're young or when you're a new Christian, you automatically look at those words and they can be very scary, you know, because you're not looking at the Bible as this compilation of books. You're looking at it as one book, essentially, and that's how you're taught in most of your uh, traditional Christian churches. So you automatically uh, look at that as it is for the whole thing, which when you study more and learn about how the Bible was put together, you will realize that none of the writers of any of the books thought they were writing Holy Scripture. Uh, I don't believe so, anyway. Uh, some people may be able to take some words from Paul as he was talking about the letters being Scriptures, Probably he was more or less talking about um, the old the Old Testament, the Torah, the Law, and you know, of the Jewish tradition, which Christianity built upon the Jewish tradition. Christianity is essentially an extension of the Jewish faith, uh, and what how Judaism views Christianity would be this this extension of, but. For them, it's not relevant, and Christians miss the mark on this. So, over the years, you know, we theologians and such, we look at, well, me personally, I look at uh, what, and I'm going to talk about this in the next podcast, kind of what's going on and what has happened and what happens to people and to preachers and pastors and theologians and such, uh, especially pastors, not so much theologians and uh, philosophers and professors, but more or less, uh, you know, your your average pastor or minister uh, who has training in the Bible, but training in the such where they're, you know, using it for ministry purposes and to uh, continue on with their agenda, and that agenda is having people serve Jesus, serve God in the most uh, applicable way that they believe set, you know, from what they've been taught is going to be for the greater good of their congregation. But what I see so much in is that we know, we know this firsthand, we know it happens all the time, and, you know, I've done it, everyone does it. Is we cherry pick scriptures. We we take scriptures from all different texts from all over the Bible, and we look at those texts and we decide what is relevant for us today. And the the science of that, the science and the art of that, is called hermeneutics, uh, which kind of uh, gets its name from Hermetic philosophy and the ancient philosophies and 
deciphering uh, text of old. So what we're doing is you're exegizing, you're, you're digging deep into what these scriptures are. And I always like to look at it as kind of like a pop-up book. So when you're learning to uh, conduct hermeneutics, instead of reading the words word for word, you're, you're now, you're wanting to make this alive and read it as if it's a pop-up book and you, the pages pop up and you, you check dates and times and you try to decipher it through other research who the author is, uh, and you will go to many different scholars and read their research on the text and uh, try to come to some kind of a good argument for or against uh, whatever text you're, or point that you're arguing for. Now, highly trained... Uh, and skilled doctors of, of scripture and the letters, you know, they're going to look at, you know, uh, manuscripts and texts in the original Greek and Hebrew and even uh, try to then translate the best that they can. You know, you have uh, many, especially fundamental churches who are really like only King James Version only and they don't want to mess around with the NIV, which is one of my favorites, because they believe it. They change words. Well, words do change, but one of the one of the miraculous things that I have seen over time is the Bible has not changed hardly at all over thousands of years, and that's due to the diligence of the copiers of the text. So you can go back to the earliest known text that we have, put them up against the Bible that you buy at Barnes & Noble or off Amazon, and it's pretty much the same. There is, you know, vowels and nouns and things like that that are changed based on, you know, a collective of theologians who... Uh, when they put together a new translation, they're trying to get, give the reader what really is being spoken. But even then, even then, what takes place is we have so many different texts, books, letters, and most of them don't necessarily boil down to what Jesus really uh, his message was really all about, which was love your neighbor, love God, and love your neighbor. You fulfilled all the law. He simplified it into just very simple words. A few sentences. So, when you read, you know, like First and Second Timothy, when Paul is giving his directives to Timothy about how a church should be run and operated, he's giving his inspire opinion on what he believes is right for Timothy to do. You will see that in all of the letters that are written to uh, congregations, to the church at large. And what we do is we take those things and we make those, well, not me necessarily, but many Churches, the large majority of Christian churches, well, even more liberal ones, and we'll take those and act as act on those to develop their dogma and doctrine of how a church should operate. So, basically, we're using a standard from other people to try to work in a society that we have today. Instead of having just a real streamlined text with, I could say, you you know, let's, since, since Christianity does base itself off Judaism, you could have the Torah, you could have the Gospels, you could have Revelation, and maybe, you know, I don't even know if I'd want to use the letters. Uh, because I think that's where people get really confused upon. And also, 
And in some aspects, I don't know if I really want to use the Torah because here's what takes place. You, you constantly see people, especially, you know, people who are anti-gay, they will use, you know, the laws found in the Torah to justify, you know, hatred. And I don't believe that that is what was intended by Jesus or any of the original apostles. I don't think that outside of the Romanization and the canonization of the text, that was really not what they were trying to create here. I believe Rome knew what they were trying to create. I knew, I believe when the church realized that they were going to receive lots of power and authority, you know, in the third, fourth century, that, yeah, let's put together these texts so that people know what Christianity really is, but then limit those texts to only the priests and doctors of the church or the Roman emperor. So then the Roman emperor could dictate to the people how he wants them to live and act and live and in concordance with his law on uh, his will. And so the Pope as well and the bishops under him. With much of it, if you would look through Christian history, was not good. You had so much murder and witch trials which brought murder and people who were being condemned as heretics, people who were cast out of the congregations because they didn't necessarily believe the way that, uh, you know, the established church was doing things when the established church was for all. So if it's for all, then everyone should be able to interpret the way that they want to interpret the text. And to sit there and have a systematic way of interpreting the text, or uh, a, a systematic way of creating dogma and doctrines, and then you know pushing that upon the people as laws and decrees, it just creates a lot of confusion. And that confusion has led to you know ten thousand denominations that believe they know the will of God. And I know this is something that I've talked about in the podcast many times. Because it's something that I've experienced in my own personal life, and it's, I think everyone has, uh, especially, you know, if you've been in the church world as long as I have, you either come to this real depressed way of feeling about it, or you just buy into it, and that's what you promote. I used to buy into it. I used to buy into it and promote it, and now I have drastically changed my ways, and become kind of a quasi-deconstructionist. I still call myself a Christian, but not in the same light that many people may uh, believe that Christianity is. And that's where I feel like maybe I've just kind of left this planet when it comes to these things. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of over it. You know, really, I'm, I'm kind of over the way that ministers fleece the flock and ask for money and, you know, uh, use the scriptures to promote hatred and racism, use the scriptures to keep people from being human sexually uh in keeping people from being human just being free of uh worries it, it seems like it seems like the text is not freeing in the sense that jesus when he talked to the pharisees he would tell them that you know you go to foreign lands and you get recruits you then burden them down with so much weight more weight than what you actually, uh, than what you have on yourself. So a person's not free. And, and Jesus was synonymous with freedom. And being free from all this burdensome law that the Torah put upon people 
through that text and then through how the doctors of the law then saw fit to uh, interpret it and place it upon the Jewish people. It's uh, it's messed a lot of people's heads up. It's messed a lot of people's heads up. And we're coming to a time where there's a different kind of revival, a different kind of awakening happening in our time. And I, I believe that this is it's causing a lot of friction from the traditional to the new age, so to speak. And when I mean new age, I'm not talking about you know, like what people think of the New Age movement, but the new eon, the new way of life that we're living here in the 21st century. We live in a time period that was is not like people 2,000, 4,000 years ago. And we even see that, in, you know, in a micro level with our uh, Declaration of Independence and our a constitution of the United States. We try to interpret that and we have judges interpret this text and that text is much simpler than um, the Bible, but we have ministers who, yes, many, uh, you know, like myself, have gone through seminary and obtained a, a long graduate degree in religion or Christianity or a master of divinity or a doctor of ministry, whatever. And we're not judges, but in a sense, we act as judges when we interpret it and give it to people. And I'm doing the same thing now, and I could be totally wrong. I could be totally wrong, and I could be thinking to myself that, you know, changing this text or Taking away the text is not right, and we shouldn't do that. I'm not advocating for an abolishment of the text. What I kind of see is a streamlined canon that is not lengthy and doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, hard to figure out. Uh, passages where people can decipher it in so many different ways, but you know, basically based on love and kindness, don't be mean to people. I don't know if that is too hard to uh, take. We know that before the Romanization and canonization, the Gnostics, who I greatly respect, had many texts of their own, and they were very free, and there was no real worry about being called a heretic so much because the church was not that strong. It was it was very weak and fledgling, and they didn't have government power to regulate, you know, what people uh, did. And you would have, you know, uh, doctors of the church like Oregon who. All we know from, he would criticize the Gnostics, and all we know about a lot of the Gnostics is from the critics, uh, because they burned those texts. They did not allow those texts to exist. We do have a wealth of treasure in the Nag Mahadi library uh, of ancient Gnostic texts that may go back, is that may go back to the early church, but probably do not. Uh, they probably give uh, some insight into the text that were before, and they could be recopied, but we don't necessarily know. Uh, and, and here lies all of the confusion is into what we should believe and not believe, and it all goes back to the real simple love God love people, just try to do the next right thing and you're going to be okay. Jesus loves you, God loves you, I love you, and let's be happy. And I don't think that we should take away the books of the Bible by any means. What I mean is, is the canon too long? So, 
just as Protestants took away uh, several books that you would find in your Catholic Roman Catholic Bibles, and the Christ, most Protestants uh, who you, who are even aware of those texts would tell you that those are not bad books at all. They're actually great books to study and to read, but don't use those as scripture. So you don't cherry pick those words because those aren't real scripture. Councils decided upon what real scripture was through a laborious process, and most of, if not all of the texts that we have come through those councils who decided what was going to be in the, the canon and what was not. And we are the same just as those people were. We can decide just as those people decided. You know, we can seek God and know and try to know our own truth because we all have our own truth within us. I just find, I, I find it anymore since I kind of felt like I left this planet spiritually in a sense that we don't, uh, we could get along a lot easier if we use the letters and the Old Testament as text of knowledge, good text to read, but let's not get carried away and just because Paul says that women should cover their head and stay silent, that's how we should treat women today. You have many denominations, even the Southern Baptist, I mean a huge, huge denomination, uh, the seminary that I attended and, uh, and still attend for my doctoral studies is primarily Southern Baptist, and you're going to have a large percentage of those individuals never allow a woman to be a pastor, or if someone has been divorced, or things like that. I mean, and that all comes from the biblical text, and you see those are just some major issues uh of, that can cause great confusion amongst people who <clears throat> try to do their best. <clears throat> Excuse me, some water. Try to do their best with what they have. You know, they, they, they give a good, honest attempt to, to listen to their pastors, to listen to their elders. And I just think it all just becomes a little crazy. I don't have any real vast words of wisdom on this. I've actually never heard of anybody wanting to do this. And I'm not going to take it upon myself to do it. But I look at the text differently than maybe a lot of other people because I look at it in the way that, okay, Paul or James or Peter said this, well, that's fine. But if we can gain some loving knowledge from these things, that's great. But if it causes confusion, let's just leave it alone because it's doing counter what I believe Jesus really intended. When Jesus wanted to build his church, was he wanted to build it upon confusion? I don't think so. I don't think that Jesus wanted to build his church upon confusion. And I believe we should take lesson from that and understand that we can get along, we can agree to disagree on the text, and we can look at the text in a way that uh, is not so uh, damning and is not so canonized, Romanized, uh, I know this is hard to hear. I know it's hard to listen to. And, and I think if you're from the fundamental standpoint, you're not going to want to listen to it. You're not going to want to hear it. Because oftentimes when you grow up and you live your whole life doing things one way, you're not going to want to do things another way. You're going to want to stick with what you know because 
that's what sounds more appealing. But I think there can be great lessons to be learned through a little bit of deconstruction and trying to understand why do you believe the way that you do? What are the root causes? And what what things are going on in your life at the moment that uh, creates this type of uh, mindset in which we treat every letter that's in the Bible as law? I don't know. You tell me. I would like your feedback. I really would. I really would. I don't like the the adage where we use the text to uh, verify the text. It's very commonly taught in seminary where you use the text to decipher the text, to, to validate it. That's just silly in a way. I mean, how do you do that? I mean, I know how you do it, but... How does it even make sense? I don't think it does. I think it, it, it just creates and compounds the problem. So I would encourage you to study hermeneutics. I would encourage you to study, you know, the foundations of the Bible. I would encourage you to get the Gnostic text. I would encourage you to seek out and do research on your own and to, uh, if you have questions, question it. You're not questioning God. You're not, God wants you to question things. You know, Jesus often asked a lot of questions. He was very, uh, he was very, he reminded me a lot like Socrates. He, he asked so many questions that it led to his death. And we've taken, Things so out of context, I believe, that uh, it's so unraveled that maybe we just need to start over. What do you think? Anyway, that was a good, there's my message for today. Backyard Preacher. Having a little anxiety, even uh, talking this way, I think. Maybe it's just uh, my own fears talking to the public about these things. And it can be difficult to uh, say these things when, you know, you've been taught one way for so long. Well... If you like this podcast, share this podcast. If you don't like it, share it anyway. Call me a bunch of names. I don't care. Or say, Nate, you're awesome. I don't care. We'll talk later. Good night.